and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Danny Cannell. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson. We're counting down the days to the NFL Draft. We're getting together our notes because no one knows these players like we do. You are hearing so much uninformed analysis from all these talking heads. I mean, they're, they're talking about, uh, I'm not going to say any names on here, but you're trying to talk about like Justin Fields playing baseball as a distraction. Get out of here. The man hasn't even played the sport in a couple years. Uh, we're just grasping at straws. We're throwing up smoke screens. So here's what you're going to have coming from us uh, in NFL draft week here at the end of the month. We're going to have a show going into the draft that is – taking a look at some of our favorite prospects and and really sort of dialing in on some of the storylines where uh, we've got our attention. Then on NFL draft night uh, for the first round, we will have a Thursday night instant reaction show. So make sure you are subscribed to that. Here today, we're going to jump into the big old bag of mail with something that we promised, which was if you jumped in and you left a five-star review and you said, hey, all those spring gleaning minutes and you didn't talk about my favorite team. If you put in a request, we're going to honor that. And that's what we're doing here today in the big old bag of mail. But first, uh, some headlines and uh, a quick look ahead to this weekend's spring games. So first, the uh, one-time transfer rule now like unanimously approved. Uh, congratulations on your, your unanimous vote, uh, NCAA decision makers on that one. I Like we have been slowly moving towards this process. I feel like they've, you know, sent up all their balloons to get all the public sentiment. They've gotten everybody in their corner from like a public relations standpoint. Here's some of the details that are important as to, you know, what happens next. You need to have your name in the transfer portal by May 1 in order to be eligible for the fall. So are we about to see just like, Everything go crazy uh, here in the next couple of weeks as players decide to capitalize on the one-time transfer rule. Again, coaches, players, all those around college football have been anticipating that this one-time transfer rule will pass. Uh, it will go into effect immediately. Again, if you want to be eligible for the fall, you need to have your name in the transfer portal. And because it's a one-time transfer rule, uh, it needs to be your first opportunity to transfer. So, We've discussed it a little bit within the broader context of, you know, uh, the way things have been changing for players in terms of NCAA bylaws and legislation. But now that the rule has gone into effect and it has become part of our reality in college football, um, real quickly, I mean, you know, what's what do you think is next? And and what are some of your uh, predictions or, or in, what are you anticipating with the one time transfer rule now on the books? I don't know how I mean, I think once the transfer portal became a thing, we saw the number of transfers really spike, like a, a large leap in players entering the portal, at least interested in possibly transferring. I don't know if this rule now passing is going to have as dramatic a change as that did, because I, I, I feel like we're already a few years into it. And I feel like the NCAA has been dragging its feet on it for so long. I mean, like we're already seeing in college basketball a really busy transfer portal with the anticipation that this rule change was going to come. So everybody kind of anticipated this. And I think in football, there had already been a lot of that from players who had already entered the portal after last season with the anticipation that this rule was going to pass. And now that spring practice is ending, we typically see in any given year, a lot of players who have gone through a couple of weeks of practice with their team and now realize where they are on the depth chart and where their, you know, their role is enter the transfer portal. So I don't think we're going to see some huge increase in cases. What I think we're going to see are fewer instances of Lincoln Riley and coaches like complaining about players transferring within conference because now they really won't have a say in it. Oh, I think it's just the beginning though. Um, what is the, I know in basketball for a while, it was doubling football is doubling the number of players that enter the transfer portal at some time. It can't keep doubling or you catch up to everybody. Right. So right. I wonder what the, the settling number will be. I mean, it'll be thousands. Um, I don't know what the latest one I found one from February, but I feel like even since February 2nd, it would be up from 1500. That was the number there, which is double the number that we had last year. I just, I, again, I wonder where it stops. I do, like, I'm concerned about it, but at the same time, I loved watching 
what Joe Burrow did at LSU. Yes. And I loved watching what Kyler Murray did at Oklahoma and Jalen Hurts did at Oklahoma. And, you know, the list is pretty lengthy of programs. Who, I'm looking forward to watching Mackenzie Milton at Florida State. Like there's a long list of players, successful stories that have actually helped programs. I do think there are far more that don't benefit, but you don't read about them because they're not the big names. But I have a question for you guys. Do you think, because I have a prediction, I don't think this is going to satisfy people. The one, like the, the one time freebie. Mm. Like, I think it's like a lot of things in our society. Like once you kind of get your way, like the pendulum swings pretty wide and then it stays there. I don't think we've gone far enough of player empowerment yet because one of the biggest things I heard was, well, coaches can hop from job to job. They can leave the program. Well, guess what? A lot of those coaches leave multiple programs and they do it after just one year. So I wonder in five years, if we're still evaluating this and you'll still see players complaining saying, well, I wasn't happy. It didn't work out for me. I want to try. And we've already seen players transfer multiple times and there's some success stories there too. There's, you know, there's some, other, but I just wonder if this is enough, the name image and likeness in this, is this enough? Is this it? Like, is this the player empowerment movement? Or there's still drastic changes to come on the horizon because I feel like we're still going to keep going down this path. Oh, there'll be more changes coming. It's I, just, it's just like anything. I think I, I like you said. It, if, right now, it's like, woo, all right, cool. They get to move once, first time freebie. Woo, no, you're out. But that will definitely eventually become well. They should be able to move multiple times if they want, as long as they have eligibility remaining. They should be able to do what anybody else is able to do just like coaches and just like we see with the playoff. Well, we start with two, we'll move to four, we move to eight, or just like we see with replay review in sports, but we'll start with just this. Oh, wait, now we'll add this. Well, what if we start reviewing this? It's the disease of more. It, it's always going to keep changing where it's never going to be enough. But I think that's been the case with sports forever. It's just now we're entering more into a player empowerment era of the changes and the continued evolving, you know, evolution of sport as it is. If I can do that reckless thing where I, I mention an area that I have no idea how it works, but just like broadly say that I, I would like to see it fixed. Uh, if there's another step, I, and I, I, I don't know what it would be, but it would be on the health and safety front and mainly for protections, right? Like a, some sort of um, some sort of like health insurance type um, protections or some sort of uh, safety net. And I don't, I can, I, I don't know exactly the way that um, those systems are set up right now for student athletes, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, player movement, right? Okay. That's going to be one thing. That is the, the first level box. Number two, name, image, and likeness. Okay. That is a, you know, that's an, another box. And it, I think that on the health and safety box, that's where you try to create um, some sort of opportunity such that if you do have catastrophic or life-changing injuries participating in college athletics, that there is um, some system set up such that you can receive support. And again, I just like in the same way that people are like, oh, healthcare is broken, fix it. And they don't actually provide any uh, opportunities or any ideas. I don't have the ideas here, but to answer your question, Danny, I, I think that that is the next step or another step that you could take in terms of this player movement would be uh, being able to negotiate or being able to receive some sort of support on the health and safety standpoint that might extend beyond your eligibility, right? That, that might extend uh, beyond the time that you leave. And so I'm, and I'm not sure how, how you fund it, I'm not sure how it looks like, but I do think that that's a discussion worth continuing without saying that it's like us being gluttonous and just wanting the disease of more to continue. Another interesting aspect of this that I think doesn't really get mentioned is the way that the fan experience is going to change. Because if you think about college sports and the relationship between fans and the schools that they root for, there's, you know, there's the natural one of, I went to school there. I care about the school and therefore I care about the sports teams. But then there's also just fans who don't really have any association with the school other than I grew up in the area. I liked college sports and this is a school that I chose to root for. But like you see it 
when you get to pat like a passionate college football fan is following like you know from recruiting they're following these kids in high school following the recruitment of them to their school and it's kind of a situation where you would watch a kid in high school he'd commit to your school then you'd watch him go through three or four years depending on what you know five years six years sometimes and then they would move on and you'd kind of you know the churn they'd keep coming but now we're going to see a situation and i think college basketball fans are kind of already there with it because the roster turnover there is so great considering the difference in the size of the rosters where a kid the churn from season to season is completely different like it used to be with a college basketball team you'd get the kid as a freshman there'd be a couple one and duns and guys who'd leave for the nba early but you'd basically watch the kid grow up from freshman to senior senior day move on blah 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 now like every single year half the roster is new players because of transfers from schools and we're going to start seeing that now more in football we kind of already have but it's just going to be on a larger scale with you know 85 scholarships per team so i wonder how that is going to impact the fan experience with the teams i wonder if there's going to be less of a personal connection and i wonder what possibly that could have with you know what kind of ramifications that could have for the sport in the long haul and I wonder, like, you know, with, like, the recruiting industry, are fans going to really pay close attention to – as close attention to high school recruiting as they have been, knowing that that kid might just leave a year later if he Hell doesn't yeah. play right away? Or, yeah. But, yeah. They will. <laughs> I, think they I don't – I, 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 I'm telling you, maybe not immediately, but if it becomes more where it's constant, where players are constantly leaving and they're able to take advantage of this, I think you're going to see less of a personal connection between fans and the players. It's going to be more about – see. This has always been my argument about why players won't be as marketable. I do think the true college football fan roots, roots for their school. Mm -hmm. They don't root for the players as individual. Now, if that player's wearing that Clemson jersey, then yeah, I'm all in. And I do think there were some Bama fans that appreciated Jalen Hurts. And I think they rooted for him when he went to Oklahoma but they're diehard Crimson Tide fans through and through. Like, I don't think they're going to lose their affinity for Alabama because a couple players leave the program. I think that's what makes college football special. And if you're right, that scares me. Like, I, if, you're, if you're right, and I think college basketball has been devastated by the one and done and before that by allowing player, you know, when you can't even hardly get up to speed with who's on your roster, and then all of a sudden you fall in love with a Zion Williamson and he's gone after a year – I think that would get tired. That would get tiring and you'd get kind of like, uh, but I still think Duke basketball fans are still just as crazed about Duke. I don't think they've, I think the, again, the top 20, top 25 programs in the country that have rabid fan bases. I don't think they're going to lose any of their passion. Now there have been some fans that do not like the player empowerment movement for whatever reason. It's a little bit weird. Like, why wouldn't you want these young men to succeed in whatever they do and wherever they go? And who cares if they make some money in their pocket, but there I've seen some people say, well, if they get paid, I'm not watching. That's not true. I don't think so either. <laughs> Colin, <laughs> oh, your bluff. I remember, <laughs> yeah. I remember when everybody stopped watching the NFL a couple of years ago too. Yet they just right? signed a really huge new TV deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you guys? Um, so let me just talk about, because I think we're, one qu another question for you guys, because these are some of my concerns, because I I was against this firmly seven or eight years ago, and now I'm full circle. I'm like, you might as well embrace it. Anything you guys think there should be any restrictions put on this as far as when to contact, when you can enter? Because I do. I think there should be some restrictions as far as like you can't enter it during the season, mid season. If you do, you're not allowed to be contacted. I Coaches complain, and I think the biggest reason coaches complain, yes, it's going to make their job more difficult, and nobody feels bad for coaches making millions of dollars. But how do you coach a player that you're kind of worried in the back of your mind, if I yell at him or I bench him or I sit, take him out of this drill because he's having an awful practice and deserves it, or he's having a horrible performance and deserves it, but you're kind of nervous that, he's still in contact with a school that was recruiting him six months ago. You know, like the recruiting off the rosters, I can't stand. And yet that is where I think is changing just as dramatically as the actual portal itself. As you're, I mean, hey, we have a guy that was a part of this podcast that I'm sure is out there perusing rosters right now. 
oh, you were a three or four star. You're not getting that playing time over there in Tennessee. Well, come on down the road to Nashville. We'll, but you know, we we'll got opportunity for you. And I understand that aspect of it, but I think there's a time and a place for it. But again, how do you police it? And going back to the coach's argument, well, it happens with coaches. Their agents talk to people. They talk to other schools while they're on the program. So I don't know if there's a solution to it, kind of like Chip's issue with, you know, player, you know, benefits. I, I wonder if, I mean, I think you kind of touched on it a little bit. Like, I, I don't know what kind of rules or regulations I would put on it right off the top of my head. I mean, I think... I think ethically I'm against it, but like just as a personal fan wise, just for keeping things, you know, just the natural desire to keep things as they are, then yeah, I think there should be. But I wonder, like maybe there could be like a time window. Like you said, there is. But yeah, like I, okay. I'm talking about there's only, so like there's only a certain amount of time where you can enter the portal, like from May 1st to August 1st. You know, it's based on your for fall and winter sports. You've got a May one deadline to enter the transfer portal and be immediately eligible for the coming season. I mean, okay, there's still kind so that's of not just for good. this year. That's going to be a permanent thing. Spring athletes will have a July one deadline in order to gain immediate eligibility, and I see that as basically a semester based approach, right? Like your, your semester ends, you've got to at least be in the transfer portal by May 1 if you want to get that immediate eligibility through the one-time transfer rule. And then if you're a spring athlete, then July 1 gives you, you know, a little bit more time. I, I think that those are going to be in place the rest of the way. But, like, I wish there was a starting window because yeah, who's to say a player in November – that's what I was saying. You know, he gets benched too. and he's like, oh, I'm pissed. I'm going straight to the portal, you know, okay. like, and yeah. announces on Twitter and is there. And then all of a sudden, like, that's where I, I don't want that because that will be a distraction. I'll hate it. A lot of fans will hate it. And that'll be a talking point. Like, I wish it was, all right, soon as, you know, I mean, you know, Kelly Bryant did that. Because mm -hmm. yeah. then we get the four game red shirt rule where you're trying to make yeah. sure that you transfer. Before within the and first I don't, four games, but I don't want to have that situation arise again because I feel like Kelly Bryant had a lot of vitriol thrown his way, and you could potentially avoid a situation like that, but it prevents you from an opportunity. Like he was able to go and become eligible faster and start playing, but I do think it's going to open you up to scrutiny. That hey, if you're willing, if you want to, for you know, undergo that. But I also think there's some decisions made in haste during a season. You know, like see if you can, Motions especially for freshmen and sophomores, like you're a freshman, you're tired, you're mentally battered, you're not playing like you thought, like you could make an emotional decision in that moment where maybe it doesn't change anything in two or three months, but at least you have a little perspective that may change after a year. Yeah. So like, would, can they, can they figure out a way to approach the transfer portal or whatever the hell they want to call it from this point forward? Kind of like they do the recruiting cycle where there are dead periods. There are, you know, like there's a recruiting calendar of what you can and can't do at certain times of year. Do we eventually see this evolve to where the same thing is happening with transfers where you can enter the portal during this time of year. You can talk to other schools during this time of year. You have to be in by this time of year. You have to pull back by this date, that kind of thing. I would like that. I think that I would support that. And I imagine coaches who are very used to the recruiting calendar, I, I imagine that they would too. And, um, and I guess maybe like my one sort of lingering thing on this in terms of, you know, is this enough? I, I think that one thing that this eliminates is the confusion about the waiver process where over the last four to five years, a lot of waivers have been given out, but at the same time, some haven't. And it was just a really frustrating process in terms of uh, with the schools, the players, the players' families, uh, fans trying to figure out whether or not somebody's going to be able to get cleared, going to be able to be eligible. And so it, at least for that first transfer, now we've taken that out. We've taken all that uncertainty away, and that's no longer a hiccup that anyone has to do. Like when I think about the one-time transfer rule, uh, I immediately was like, yeah, well, I mean – players had figured out enough reasons to be able to almost have the one-time transfer rule exist. You just had to have the resources to get the right lawyer to put together your case, because we've heard from the NCAA side of things that the way the paperwork is put together from player to player is wildly different mm -hmm. and often ends up dictating whether or not you're able to get eligibility. So 
all interesting stuff to continue to track. Uh, coming up this weekend, you know, we've been our we had the uh, the Clemson spring game, then we had Florida State and UCF. It's a it's a pretty loaded weekend. So the follow here's the following schools are, are all going to be having spring games, and this is by no means the entire list, but certainly some ones that stood out to me: uh, Alabama, Auburn, Georgia, LSU, Miami, Ohio State, and USC. So of those schools, and you know, if you want to open the mystery box to another team who's got its spring game this weekend, wanted to see which of those games or which of those teams are, are interesting you are the most interesting to you, and what are you going to be looking at uh, for those games? I mean, I think the most interesting ones for me are Alabama and Ohio State, simply because there is the question of you know, like so many, so much to replace Alabama. Though I think it's I think we're probably safe saying Bryce Young will be the quarterback at Alabama next year, even yeah. if it's even if it's not, you know, set in stone. So I think Ohio State, which granted I have to sit and write about as soon as we're done recording, but like the quarterback competition there was where Stroud is kind of seen as the front runner. So getting like the spring game to see, even though Ryan Day is not going to name a starter anytime soon, nor should he you're going to get a pretty good idea of who's in first place at this point based on who's playing with who and getting how many snaps with which players. So I, I, I'm interested in seeing that. And then other than that, I mean, I guess Brian Harson's first spring with Auburn, seeing how they look with a new coach and a new offense and seeing if Bo Nix is like how he's looking any different, just that kind of stuff. But there's, you know, it's, it's typical spring week, spring games. I, I'm interested. I'm not that interested. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as far as ranking your level of interest, what you would find intriguing, new coach, quarterback battles. Like, I think the, like those two things are really what are going to draw you to watch those. So Auburn, perfect example. Ohio State, perfect example. LSU, good example. You know, you got a couple, a few quarterbacks battling for that job. Um, Bama doesn't do anything for me because I'm like, I'm with you. Like, I... Like maybe, yeah, you get some new faces, but the Bill O'Brien offense, eh, like it doesn't really, like you just know Bama's going to be fine. Um, so I would, I would kind of label it. Those are the things that intrigue me the most. Let me try to sell you on why Bama is interesting. Okay. And it's not just because we know Nick Saban's going to look good and he's going to basically be talking on the broadcast the whole daggum game. But I, it was in the spring game he was an early enrollee at the time, but like Jerry Judy had 212 yards and three touchdowns or something stupid. Like there have been some skill position players and they don't always end up paying off uh, that particular year. Like I think Jalen Waddle might've been another one there, but I'm kind of curious to see uh, about the Alabama wide receivers and the pass catchers. You know, we talked about some of it during spring gleaning, but it's a lot of unproven talent. I mean, talent without a doubt, you know, players like, you know, Javon Baker, uh, Tyro Jones, Bell, uh, Xavier Williams, like all guys that were, you know, four-star guys. We saw jo John Mechie will not be playing in the game as he continues to rehab from an injury. I mean, Slade Bolden, Hunter Renfro, part four, you know, like we're, we're looking and you mentioned Jaleel. You know I want to see Chip. Yeah, that's what? exactly like Bill O'Brien, new offensive coordinator. We saw his offenses at Penn state and in the NFL, probably involved the tight end more than Steve Sarkeesian's did. So Jaleel Billingsley, who kind of flashed and had some really good moments for that offense. I want to see Jaleel Billingsley and how they're using him in the offense this year, because I think that he could be kind of a Kyle Pitts kind of player for this. Six, four, great body size. Uh, yeah. You mentioned him during the spring gleaning. I, I think that seeing who flashes in those game in the Alabama spring game is as interesting to me as the Ohio state quarterback battle, just because I think Ohio state's got great options at quarterback, right? <laughs> I just think that the offense will be pretty good uh, regardless of who ends up winning it. And again, I guess my prediction right there uh, is CJ Stroud. How about what we're going to be looking for too? And this is going to be a part of the free agency era. How about Tyler Shuck in a Texas tech uniform? Like what does he look like? Um, and by the way, how do you guys feel about ESPN's football power index, FPI? Texas Tech, by the way, a preseason number 21 seems a little bit lofty, but I'm not upset about that as much as I am. Did you guys see where Mississippi State is in the eight. football power? Number eight. 
Must be that SEC, SEC strength. SEC. Oh, man, it's just whew, that SEC strength. Oh, that West just powerhouse. Must be why there. I don't. I how do you? I do not know how you justify it. So like you got some returning starters. I get, but one of the things is supposed to be coaching tenure, previous years results, uh, recruiting rankings. Like I just I don't understand how you can justify anything. Maybe the, maybe they're hanging a lot on the LSU win last year. Well, they knocked off a fifteen and zero from the season before LSU team in week one. Maybe that's where you're justifying it. Two questions. What about Iowa State being ranked ahead of Ohio State? Yeah. And two with their FBI because I'm not that familiar with how they do their FPI. I wonder, I'd like to see how much, like once the season starts, how much of the off season projection remains in their ratings, because I, I, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical. I didn't so, exactly endear the football power index people to like, when I was there, I did not, I, I and I've had the same opinion I do now. I can't stand it. Like, I don't understand the formula, and I think it doesn't make much sense. I will just say that I believe ESPN has another set of rankings yes. that they use from <laughs> yes. another writer who has been a guest on this podcast, <laughs> Bill Connolly and the SP Plus ratings that I have far more confidence in than I do the FPI. Why? Wow, that's, I was just pulling it up because you know where Mississippi State is in the preseason SP Plus? 44. An Much more accurate. Yes. 44. <laughs> yes. uh, Ohio State, yeah, it's Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, Ohio State, Oregon, Georgia, Iowa State, Miami, Wisconsin, North Carolina. Boy, that's a top 10 that makes sense to me. Do, have uh, you seen the Pac-12 rankings in the SP? They hate the Pac-12. Not the SP Plus, in the Football Power Index. Oregon is the highest ranked. I forget where they were. They're way down the list at uh, 17. USC who is going to be a trendy pick at 26 outside the top 25. Good luck with that. I don't know. We kind of got in a side tangent. It feels like we could have done a whole pod on the football. Just power ripping index. apart. The FBI. <laughs> well, that's no, that's what they want. Okay. Yeah. They, they find it. They run the numbers and they're like, Ooh, that's inflammatory. Throw <laughs> it on fine bomb. Throw it on Twitter. Let's get this machine going. Let's rank all the players under 25. Then argue about the ranking of players under 25. Yep, it's great. Yep. It's great. Great. The way the contents uh, machine can go. Speaking of the content machine, when we did our spring gleaning episodes, we, we, we couldn't, we couldn't do all 130 teams. You know, we just, we, we needed to be able to, to draw a line in the sand. And there were some teams that we love uh, that didn't make the cut. So we asked you, the listeners, if you were really feeling passionate about uh, a team that did not get covered in spring gleaning, if you left a request in the review, then we would come back and we would uh, give you that spring gleaning. We are going to do that. Starting with the troops next. All right, here we go. We've got multiple questions that are requesting uh, some, some service Academy love here. Uh, so this first one says, love the pod, uh, blah, blah, blah. love the pod followed bud from his previous employer to Barton and bud. And now here was very pleasantly surprised to hear Danny, who I used to listen to in high school for his previous employer. and was very happy to get to encounter Tom and chip who have both been fantastic. I'm a big fan of watching the service academies, despite not having ties to any of them. I would love to hear y'all give your projections and outlook for this year. Does Navy look poised for a bounce back? Is Army going to continue its recent renaissance? Any concern for either of those coaches leaving or are they pretty locked in? Uh, go ahead and give uh, this one's specifically for Army from a user named Navy Sucks. Loves the show. I miss Barton and wish him the best. I'm an Army grad whose parents and wife went to BYU, so I love both. The BYU segment on the Group of Five and Independent Spring Gleaning episode was great, but I do want to point out that the Nakua brothers, who Bud said will be weapons for the Utes this season, are actually both enrolled at BYU now. Good news for the Cougars. I would love a spring gleaning segment about the service academies to look ahead to the commander in chief trophy. And while I'm at it, what would the academies need to do to be truly relevant in the national college football picture while staying true to their big picture mission? Make this is the best CFP podcast. Keep up the great work. Hashtag make army football great again. Hashtag Navy doesn't give a ship. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's more difficult to kind of like do this for the service academy simply because it's, you know, with the way that the roster is put together with recruiting and then just, you know, 
actual cadets and and stuff it's it's hard to really know what the depth chart truly looks like and i feel like it it's where with like a power five school like with alabama going into the spring we kind of know like who's going to be where on the depth chart who's competing for what when it comes to surface academies it's not even just that the information is isn't readily available it's just i feel like it's more of a true kind of spring in that more things are open that probably aren't while of course obviously multiple year starters are going to stay where they are on the depth chart but like if you look at navy i I think xavier arline is in the lead for the quarterback spot he finished the army navy game he played he played well there so i think that he's the leader but i don't think anybody's handing him the job and i think frankly for navy if you ask kenya to malolo he's just happy he has the spring practice this year so forget about figuring out who's going to be where and who's doing what but there's they, they've got a lot to replace if we look at the uh returning production rankings from Connolly, who has the superior rankings on espn They've got their 80th overall returning production, but they're only 98th on offense. And I feel like for an option team, like when it comes to the service academies, if they've got a lot back on defense, that's good. If they lose a lot on defense, that's bad. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. I don't really know how much it changes the projection for the team. But when you're running an option offense, returning production, I think, is good. So Navy loses a lot from its offense, and I think that is going to be a problem. That could be something that, you know, they obviously they've been practicing this spring that they have to address. That is something to keep in mind going into next next season. I think Army's in a better position because Army generally has just about everybody back. So I, I think that if you look at Army this spring, there's plenty of reason to be optimistic that they're going to be another eight, nine, maybe 10 win season, depending on the schedule, depending on how things break. I think Army's going to be fine. I think that right now, if I'm handicapping the commander in chief trophy, I'm tilting towards Army because I mentioned the returning production on Navy. Air Force is even you know more critical. They rank 115th overall. They're 91st on offense. They're 116th on defense. So Air Force is pretty much just going to be an entirely new team from what we saw last year. And we didn't see a whole lot from them last year. They didn't play in as many games. I remember Jeff Munkin got ticked off because he thought they were dodging him with using COVID as an excuse. They did eventually play. But so I I think going into the spring, plus Air Force, by the way, their spring practice is done. So there's nothing to look for. But I just think that that's kind of how I feel. It's really difficult to know what to expect from the service academies in the spring compared to, you know, your typical power five and group of five schools. But I do think that based on what I do know, I'm much more confident in Army going into the year based on what they have coming back from last year than anything. I would agree with that. I think it's, I mean, Navy, remember the start of last year, the opening game of the season when they, a Monday night national crowd, weird because there was nobody there. It was one of the first times we saw that and they didn't pump in any music. It just was weird. And then they got trounced 55 to three. And then afterward, Ken Niamatololo drops the bomb on everybody said, well, we haven't even been tackling. Like we haven't, even, like, well, Oh, well, I wish we would have known that on our pick special, like on our locks pod, that would have been good information to have. Um, then afterwards he admitted, Hey, I made a mistake. I bet he was trying to be safe. I do think like we talked about the big 10 impacting the big 10 was impacted more severely than the sec, ACC, big 12 because of the stop start. I think, the academies impacted even more so from a couple because they were stricter in policy, but also, I mean, I'm looking at an article here about the spring practice and it said earlier this semester that uh, semester, they had a three week lockdown. Mm-hmm. Um, so they couldn't do any athletic activities, training, spring football, like uh, weight room, anything, meetings, anything in person. It said they were confined to their dorm room. Well, if you go to Ohio state or Michigan confined to your dorm room, is we hope you stay in your room, right? We'll probably all realize that they're probably living a normal existence, probably being cautious, but at the academies, you are locked in your dorm room. Like, and oh. that is yeah, like, you are not, you are like, you are doing what they tell. I mean, that's what's so like crazy. You might be living in the apartment with two teammates that's yeah. within walking distance of the facility, but it, you know, it's not getting patrolled in the same way right. that the dorms are at a service academy. Right. And especially in COVID. So I, I think like that has me concerned because I think it's another impacted season, but I would say out of all of them, I'm with you, Tom. I feel like army 
is is a little bit of a better spot. And it played out last year's game. They got the better of them, shut them out. It wasn't exactly pretty. I think Army needs to figure out their quarterback situation. If they could play one, I think that'd be helpful as opposed to four, <laughs> like yeah. they did last year. Um, but I feel better about them. In Air Force, I feel like I would probably put Navy in third of the three. You know, so I, of, of level of confidence. I yeah. feel like I've got to throw out last season because they didn't play for a month. Like the way the schedule broke down, like you mentioned the not tackling uh, in the 55 to three loss, but then they come back and they beat Tulane. They beat Temple. They beat ECU. The Air Force blows the doors off them in early October. But then from October 31st to November 28th, they don't play. Uh, game, three games postponed and not be in an action. And when they do return, it's a 10 to seven loss to Memphis. Mm -hmm. Ugly, ugly game. But like also you held Defensively, Memphis. Defensively, the point, sound was last you know? two games of the year. Yeah, 19 to six to Tulsa. Now Tulsa, you know, won with defense. It wasn't a team that was going to blow you out. And then, you know, 15 to nothing loss to Army. Like I, I kind of look at, at that particular, like the way the offense wasn't able to click some of it I'm kind of able to give some uh, grace to, and that's not ignoring the fact that Navy Navy's given up ground to Army. That's going to make that's going to make Navy graduates furious, right? Because Navy had the upper hand in this rivalry for a while. The fact that Army has sort of taken control that is absolutely going to grind your gears. But in the big picture, I am willing to give in the same way that we did for some of the Pac-12 schools who only played like four games or the Big Ten schools who had a light load, even though Navy played more of a full schedule, getting 10 games in, the way the season played out, uh, I kind of think that I'm willing to overlook some of the struggles. Yeah, I, I do think Navy will be better in 2021 than it was in 2020 because like we mentioned already, just the fact that they're going to have a spring for the most part because they didn't have anything last off season and i think it's like especially with an offense like an option offense that has a huge impact on you but like you also mentioned after they had that big break during the season the offense was non-existent for their final three games but their defense played really well for the most part against you know three pretty decent teams and like i said earlier when it comes to returning production most of that defense is back most of the offense is changing but the way that that offense finished maybe not the worst thing in the world next one uh, just a, a regular listener who's back in it. He says, I've been in Chips Minchies. <laughs> App State is 63 and 15 with wins against North Carolina and USC, that's South Carolina, uh, and overtime losses to a 10 and 2 Penn State team and an 8 and 4 Tennessee team. I get the losses are moral victories only, but at least it shows a program who can compete with schools who get the best recruits. Why do they fail to get the same buzz as UCF or Cincinnati or Boise State? The Sun Belt East isn't the cakewalk it's made out to be, and it's a better division than either in the American Athletic Conference. Yo. Why is App not spoken of like one of the few top-tier Group of Five programs? It's 30 years of largely the same results. Shout out to the pod. You guys are the best, but we need our daggum respect. Roy Voice. I don't have a good Roy Williams impression, but, you know, daggum always gets the job done. Chip, here's to hoping one day I'm lucky enough to spot you at High Park and buy you a, parentheses, sponsored Coors Light. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to disagree with the Sun Belt being better than the American, but... <laughs> the Sun Belt I, East, he was very specific. No, sorry, Sun Belt East, East. I mean, <laughs> being better than right the there with the SEC West, I mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I, I think this is an interesting spring for App State because, you know, Zach Thomas is gone. And then Zach Thomas, he originally replaced uh, Taylor Lamb. So it's like App State has pretty much had like two quarterbacks for the last seven years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So they're, we're entering a new season. We're going to have a new quarterback at App State. They've got a new offensive coordinator. So I think that's interesting. But I think overall, App State, you know, besides seeing the new offense, how different it's going to look, seeing who's going to win the quarterback position, I think that App State, I know I still consider it one of the contenders in the Sun Belt. It's just I think, we're, you know, we've given more love to Louisiana this offseason because Louisiana had such a great 2020 season, and it's getting everybody back. So I, I, I still think they are the favorite in the conference, but it's not a disrespecting App State kind of situation. I still think that they're very good. I still think that 
I would pick them ahead of Coastal. And I just think, you know, it's there's there's some question marks about the team this year that typically haven't been in recent years. So I think that could be some of the reason why you you feeling disrespected. Yeah, I. By the way, the Sun Belt is really good. Like, I, and not to like we just, we're, sound like we're disparaging them. I don't think they're quite as good as the American, but their record against power five teams less last year with what coastal did has done to Kansas the past few years, what Louisiana did to Iowa state, Arkansas state beat Kansas state, Kansas state last year. I mean, there's, there's a pretty lengthy list of games that they won Georgia state. Didn't they go with Tennessee a couple years? Like there's Mm -hmm. some, there's some teams in the Sun Belt that have got some wins. I would say for app state, like that's like you want to kind of vault to the top of this discussion group of five teams that kind of become America's darlings beat Miami September 11th. You know, like if you do that, your second game of the season, we'll all be talking about app state, you know, like you, every team kind of has, and I know beating Kansas isn't a signature win, but that's why Jamie, that's why Jamie Chadwell doesn't want to take the Kansas job because he's two and zero against the Jayhawks. And right, he's like, exactly. I know how this goes. I, right. Like App State got up in the top twenty-five of the playoff committee rankings in twenty nineteen. Like mm-hmm. they, and that was a year that they beat uh, North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Like they've, they've got uh, a little bit of you know starting to flirt around with it. And we got to remember they've only been playing as a full FBS member but for so long now they've been very successful for much of that time uh, during, you know, competing for Sunbelt championships every single year, but it does take us, it does take our dumb big national college football mindset. It takes us a little while before we finally are willing to uh, get used to, to seeing your name always in there as you know, that top tier group of five. I mean, the frustrating thing for app fans is that, that Marshall game, they played awful. It was the worst game that App State played all year. They had two red zone turnovers, and the game was close. The defense played well enough to win against a Marshall team that ran it up uh, against a lot of squads. That is frustrating. So if, if they win that game, again, two red zone turnovers. You score touchdowns there, you win. Um, you missed chip shot field goal against Coastal Carolina. Like that. That's it. If, if those things happen and break the other way, then we are talking about uh, an App State team that is, what, like 11-1 and one or something like that? So the margins are right there that nothing's you know wrong with App State. I am concerned about the quarterback position because I am much love to Grace in high school's finest, but I think we've got a Chase Bryce situation on our hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's always a concern. Don't know if Chase is going to be as friendly as he was during the 2020 season. I mean, you know, it's always great to be generous. It's always good to be able to share the wealth. You give the ball to your teammates. You give the ball to the other team's teammates. You know, you you're just so friendly. That's the thing about Chase Christ. Just (laughs) Chase Christ, just the, the nicest guy in the facility. It's all anybody in death Valley was saying as he left Clemson, love him. And and I saw that on the field as he uh, continually shared the ball with the other team. There's so, been another chase in the NFL who's made about $40 million being the nice locker room guy. So don't <laughs> knock him too much. I'm just saying for, for app state success, <laughs> yes, I want, I the, agree. Yeah, I want the Mountaineers to be competing for Sunbelt championships so that me and my man can be at high park. I got dose two coming up in a couple weeks. Then two weeks after that, I'm there. You, me, playing Keno, drinking Coors Light, and watching App State football. It can happen, but... Licking uh, handrails and hugging people tight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just, I, I think that um, Chase Bryce's turnover issues are a concern when we are forecasting App State. Now, the good news is Sean Clark, former offensive line coach, they came in and they ran the ball well. They kind of had a running back by committee, and as a group, they were still able to be just as productive as they were when they had, like, you know, Darrington Evans. And, and like, a, there's a whole, like, list of App State running backs that have sort of all succeeded one another. I thought they did a good job of maintaining that identity. Defensively, they were still really good. Uh, pass defense in particular, they had, you know, one of the best secondaries in the entire country. So 
infrastructure wise, things like offensive line, running back defense, you still feel good about where you're at. My only spring question is the quarterback position. And that's totally out. fair. Totally yeah. fair. And I, but I do think this is becoming a program much like some of the ones we talk about at the group of five level where it's a good thing. It's kind of a, it's a blessing and a curse because your coaches have success and you've had good coaches, but then they go on to take another job. It is becoming a destination spot for young coaches that are really good. If you can bring in good coaches. You're probably going to lose them. But the good news is the program itself is attractive with the run of success with the destination spots, beautiful little stadium. You know, they've got some NFL guys out there. They've got us, you know, the, the Michigan game. I mean, we always hear about that every single year, like the program's in a good spot. Like, I, I just wonder if we'll ever see a team really like we were talking, debating Cincinnati. We've talked um, UCF. Like, I don't know if a team from the Sun Belt would really scare that playoff conversation, even though we all know it will never happen actuality but would we be sitting here talking about a app state or a coastal top six teams you know could they get that close and i don't think the respect is there for the conference nor i don't think it should be yeah not until the bottom of the conference kind of improves because that's that's the one thing like when we we can we compare the american and the sun belt and the other g5 conferences i think the teams at the bottom of the sun belt kind of drag the overall power rating of the conference down so like Kansas is clearly the bottom of the big 12, but we saw from the playoff selection committee that at least from three through eight or nine, it's strong enough that a two loss big 12 champion was ranked ahead of group of five teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you get a little bit more respect because even those losses against bottom half teams are going to be a little bit more difficult to come by uh, than, uh, than otherwise. Good stuff, uh, as always. Next week, we will be back on Monday, recapping some of what we learned during a loaded Saturday of spring games. Remember, we've got our eyes ahead on the NFL draft. And if you want to get in on a future mailbag episode, uh, I saw a late request here for uh, Bowling Green, and I didn't pass that one along. So next mailbag, Bowling Green, spring gleaning. I figured you guys would need some time to be able to adjust your formulas now that um, Brian Vane. better be a legit Bowling Green fan. It better not be somebody trolling us, making us go deep just to have us go deep in the roster here. (laughs) Hey, hey fellas, I'm a huge fan of the pod, especially Danny, whom my mom has a picture with from the 90s. Yeah, she must be good looking. I am a proud Bowling Green <laughs> Falcon and our mom and our team is the youngest in the country. Would love if you guys took a look at our crazy roster situation. Uh, his name is Mitchie four bags. So Mitch's mom, we've got, uh, we've got Danny delivering the Bowling Green goods for you next mailbag. Again, if, if you want to jump in and put in a special group of five mailbag request, uh, we will get it to it in a future mailbag episode. You can follow him on Twitter at Danny Cannell. You can follow him at Tom Fennell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Sup to Mitch's mom.